the phone now or the chat? Hello. Hello. Hi, hi Rakula. Uh, we're oh. just waiting for participants to join and then Catherine will get us started. Welcome to everyone who has joined so far. We've got 18 participants online. Okay. Okay. <laughs> Geoffrey, how are you? Yeah, very well, Rakura. Long time. Long time. <laughs> yeah, good to see you. Good to see you too. Hello, good morning, everybody. Um, welcome to the um, webinar. Um, we'll just wait like uh, we can give two more minutes to any participants waiting to join us. And then we can start at exactly five minutes past 10. Thank you.
All right, welcome. Good morning, everybody. Good afternoon, good evening. I believe we have participants joining us from around uh, the, the world. I um, would like to welcome you to this uh, webinar that is hosted by the Kenya Climate Smart Agriculture Multi Stakeholder Platform. And the title of our webinar today is uh, Financing Cl Climate Smart Investments in Kenya. And uh, we are looking forward to a very exciting webinar, and we're going to be discussing issues of how we are going to, um, how we can increase investments in CSA in, in, in Africa and also uh, beyond. So this morning, we have an exciting team of panelists that are going to be taking us through this webinar. Uh, we shall have Veronica Ndetu, who is the coordinator at the Climate Change Unit in the Ministry of Agriculture, Livestock, Fisheries and Cooperatives in Kenya. Um, we have Nancy Rapando, who is a steering committee in the, in the multi-stakeholder platform. And we have Laura Kramer, who is a science officer from CICAF, that's a CGI research program on climate change, agriculture and food security. Um, and then speaking to the heart of the matter will be Rakula Okoth. He's the impact investment advisor at Solidaridad. And then we have Frederico Lande, the Partnerships Manager with Financial Access, and followed by Geoffrey Musioki, is the Agriculture Investment Officer, East and Southern Africa, working with Oiko Credit International. And then we'll also have Sebastian Ogema, who's a Project Manager at SNB. So um, we're looking forward to an exciting uh, webinar, and you're all welcome. Kindly send us your questions through the Q&A and chat box that's on your screen and we shall be able to direct them to the respective speakers uh, once they have made their presentations or in the course of the webinar so i'm sure you're all curious to know what is this uh, what is the multi-stakeholder platform and what is it all about and to start us off with that introduction is uh, veronica ndetu uh, from the climate change unit she'll elaborate on what the msp is and also give us some direction as to why we are having this webinar today. Um, so um, in a few minutes, we'll have Veronica um, sharing with us. Thanks. Um, Veronica? Veronica, are you there? Hello? Thank you. Thank you. I was muted. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Now you can hear? Y yes, yes. We can hear you very well. Thank um, you. Perhaps you can, you can start as we wait for your um, presentation to, to show on the screen. Thank you. So I had yes. just uh, started by thanking you, Catherine, for hosting this meeting and uh, the CCAVS team, and thanking all the participants for having accepted to attend our meeting. Uh, this meeting has, has been explained by Catherine very clearly, is on uh, the CSA mode stakeholder platform, which uh, is a platform that has been established about two years ago. And it is picking on with membership uh, of uh, people that participate in uh, clim organizations that participate in climate smart agriculture or generally in agriculture and are addressing climate, climate change in agriculture. So uh, the purpose of the meeting today mainly is to look at the issues, uh, one of the areas uh, of uh, finance and investments, but I want generally to explain to the participants what is this multi stakeholder platform and what is the purpose or why are we together and uh, why are we even calling this meeting for the different stakeholders? So if Catherine, you can have the, the, the presentation, I can start. Okay. Okay, just by way of introduction, my name is Veronica Ndetu and I think that has been said. I coordinate the climate change unit in the Ministry of Agriculture, Livestock, Fisheries and Cooperatives. And by virtue of the ministry co uh, coordinating the multi stakeholder platform, then I uh, sit in the, uh, that platform uh, coordinating on the behalf of the ministry. So then 
one would ask, why are we discussing CSA and why is the multi-stakeholder platform for CSA? One of the main issues we need to understand is that uh, uh, agriculture in its uh, nation, uh, in the Kenyan nationally determined contribution has committed to implement climate smart agriculture as a way of uh, meeting the adaptation and mitigation goals in Kenya. And towards that, we have developed a CSA strategy and also an implementation framework. Uh, this is uh, helping us to, uh, to guide uh, in the implementation of climate smart agriculture. But then there are also other um, approaches, not necessarily climate smart agriculture, that are aimed at increasing productivity and building resilience, and also uh, reducing carbon emissions from the agriculture sector. These could be issues like carbon uh, um, CA, that is um, uh, conservation agriculture, things like agroecology, and many others that different organizations are implementing. So that is all aimed at um, the, the three objectives of CSA and all stakeholders that are involved in all that, uh, especially conservation of the environment, reducing emissions and building resilience of the agriculture systems are part of this as, uh, as an, uh, MF, MSP. Thank you. To the next slide, please. Then uh, we would ask, next slide, Catherine. Okay, fine, thank you. Uh, the, we would ask then why, why the MSP, why do we have to be in this platform? Uh, it has been realized that uh, uh, coordination among the different actors in agriculture and even in uh, more in uh, CSA is very poor. So then we have started this much stakeholder plot platform spearheaded by a few of the organizations, but having a different, very many uh, stakeholders now where we want to address the problem of poor coordination and collaboration among the stakeholders for the purpose of enhancing synergy uh, to increase adoption, to also reduce inefficiencies in our uh, undertakings and also to uh, ensure that we all report and reduce under reporting because in climate change, we know all of us are supposed to report on the, our achievement on implementing our cli uh, national climate change uh, action plan and so our NDC. So this stakeholder platform then brings together ministries, departments, uh, national and county governments, uh, players, the private sector, CSOs and development partners and including research and academia. So this is the purpose to coordinate and also to create an enabling policy. Uh, and institutional environment. So this is this platform is generally to coordinate and to ensure that everybody is on board and to also build synergy. So far, the MSP is still um, an informal and it has voluntary membership. So all the members are on voluntary basis, but uh, we have quite a number. What are the objectives? Uh, as I've just explained the purpose of the MSP, then the objectives include uh, supporting profiling of CSA action. Because for us to be able to know what we are doing, we need to know each other. So there is the uh, objective of profiling. Also the planning, implementation, monitoring, and evaluation, we need to be able to support that. Uh, to identify opportunities for investments and link SMEs to investors to support knowledge and information uh, for evidence-based decision-making. So that is generally the policy aspect. So that is, those are the four objectives of the MSP so far as agreed on by the members that have been uh, uh, part of the MSP. We have a structure whereby we have the MSP itself, or the members, and then there is a steering committee, again, also on voluntary basis. The MSP is, um, uh, as I said, is voluntary. So even the steering committee, members of organization or party to, uh, in the steering committee. And this steering committee coordinates then between the main MSP and the thematic working groups. Thematic working groups are also based on the objectives. And so they are just alongside the objectives I've just um, read or I've, I've just highlighted. And these uh, thematic working groups, again, are also on voluntary basis. Once, when we developed the concept of the MSP, members uh, offered based on their interest, uh, which objective they wanted to address, 
And so the matrix working groups are based on that. Thank you. Um, then what is, why do you want to belong, or why would any organization want to belong to the MSP? And this, we are saying that the, why it is important to belong, for you to belong to an MSP, the MSP, is that it creates opportunities for members to, one, create awareness of what they do to other stakeholders. So, I mean, running alone, your own show, is not going to be of any help. So it's good for us all to share our uh, uh, information on what we do, so that when then we can also, like I've said, reduce uh, reputations, reduce duplication, and uh, improve efficiency. We also share experiences, or we report on what we do, because then, as I said, uh, we are supposed to get report together as a sector to the Minister of Environment, and when we report nationally and globally, it is known what you do as an organization, other than when you stay alone and run your show on climate issues, and then they are not reported anywhere. Then uh, you identify opportunities for investment, and this is going to be the topic, the main topic for today. Um, so I won't insist on this. And then again, uh, you will share uh, knowledge and you establish partnerships with the other stakeholders. This is for the purpose of um, ensuring that we are all moving in the same direction and we are sharing experiences. Then I would go to the achievements. What have we been able to achieve as an MSP so far? Um, our achievements are, are based on, of course, the objectives. And what we have been able to do is to profile the organizations. These organi organizations have been filling fact sheets whereby they include what they do, what, who, who they are, what they do, and where they do it. And this is, has been supported by BioVision and the University of Nairobi by providing us with, a, who are members of the MSP, by providing us with an intern who has been interviewing some of the organizations that are members and others that had also not yet joined. And so far we have, joined, uh, we have profiled that five member organizations and the fact sheets are ready. The purpose, what we need to do next is to put this in our website and we are preparing to put them, our members have indicated that we would put these fact sheets in the Kilimo website and then provide links where organizations, where, for the, all the organizations so that not all the information about what you do is going to be put in. in the Glimo website, but then we provide a link. The planning and m and and the reporting uh, told us that we have developed an m and framework, which is now undergoing a stakeholder uh, validation. And I, we, I invite all the members, uh, those that have uh, are participating in this, we can, accept, we can uh, provide you with the m and framework so that you can also have your own inputs. We need to be able to uh, report within the framework that is acceptable to them nationally and internationally on climate change issues. Uh, and all of us need to be on board. The other issue is on investment opportunities. And this is linking agriculture enterprises or entrepreneurs with uh, investors. And this is the main topic for today, as I had said earlier. So we have brought on board some of the investors and uh, they're going to today and in the future provide us with information on how SMEs, our value chain actors, can access investments for climate smart agriculture. Then we have, lastly and not least, we have the knowledge policy gathering uh, where we have been, uh, uh, knowledge and policy where we have been gathering evidence on policy gaps to facilitate CSA implementation. And towards that, uh, the thematic working group has developed a policy brief on CSA targeting county governments. Earlier, we also, uh, some of the members of the MSP worked on uh, uh, some policy briefs for each sector uh, or subsector uh, that were supposed to, to inform the, uh, the Minister of Agriculture uh, through a breakfast, during a breakfast meeting that which was done in Feb, some policy briefs on how to implement uh, activities on climate adaptation and mitigation were presented to the national uh, government and also the COG. 
So this is generally what uh, the MSP has been formed for, to for. This is what it has been um, able to achieve. And we look forward to getting our inputs from the most of the uh, attendees of this minute, uh, meeting from today and beyond so that we can continue. enhancing uh, its uh, object in implementing climate smart agriculture. Thank you. Uh, this is uh, what we have been able to, uh, to do. And I invite all members to freely participate in this MSP, uh, get on board as members, and then we'll move on together. The rest will be said as we move on. Thank you. Um, thank you very much, Veronica, for elaborating uh, what the MSP is all about. Um, we have one question that came in uh, as you are making the presentation, and you, you may have mentioned this, but maybe you'll want to elaborate. Uh, we have a question asking, who is funding the MSP? Okay, so I can answer this question right away. Uh, thank you for now. The, all we do, most of what we do is the meetings, and uh, uh, we have been getting support for meetings from um, CCAPS. Uh, and then we have also organizations that are, but as we move forward, we would want uh, most more organizations and uh, more institutions to come on board and be able to support. And I think that we are advancing to, to, towards that direction. Particularly, we want to be able to move to the counties. And I think uh, organizations based on where they are operating, the counties in which they are operating, well, then we would be like, just like operating at uh, the national level but activity you know takes place at the county level. So that currently that is all, but uh, and, uh, other organizations have pledged some support. Thank you. Okay, um, thank you, Veronica. So if we have any members of organizations that have joined us online that are, are willing to support uh, the MSP, you're very welcome as you've heard from Veronica. Um, Veronica, just one more question before we move to the next uh, presenter. Um, Evans is asking, how do we enroll our institutions into the MSP? Um, thank you, Evans Kitui, for the question. Uh, Vero, how do we enroll our institutions into the MSP? That I have just said uh, the MSP is voluntary. So, uh, what you do is that uh, as the ministry currently is coordinating the MSP, but any of the other members, the CCAVs and the uh, BioVision, which is currently represented by Nancy, you can just give your name and then we'll, or we'll just invite you. If you give us your email, we just invite you to meetings and then we can uh, uh, place you in the thematic working group. If you are interested mm -hmm. in being a member of the steering committee, you are also most welcome. So it's just expressing your interest through either calls or emails. Thank you. Okay, um, thank you very much, uh, Veronica, for that. Um, so I think our next uh, presenter is uh, Sebastian. Um, just, uh, Sebastian, are you online? Kindly respond if you're online. Yes, uh, I am, Catherine. Okay, perfect. So I'll stop sharing my screen and then you should be able to share your screen and we can take it from there. Uh, yeah. Excellent. I have, let's wait up for uh, Laura to uh, share my uh, presentation. I was a bit lazy. Um, okay. So okay. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is uh, Sebastian, I'm the new old kid uh, on the block. I, uh, I just uh, I took over from my colleague who is also uh, on the on the call, uh, Joseph, uh, who was uh, elevated to a regional role uh, on the project. Uh, so I, I I took over something like three months ago, uh, and so um, uh, getting up to speed with the COVID uh, situation has been a bit of a of a challenge. However, uh, I would like to thank you first for inviting me to uh, present. Uh, my presentation, I'm hoping I have only, what, 10 minutes, uh, which I sh should be done by then. I'm going to present yes, on behalf of my uh, team, um, um, uh, Climate uh, Resilient Value Chains for Improved Livelihoods, CRAFT, 
uh, quite a, a mouthful, um, but uh, it also represents our ambition. Uh, we, we are extremely ambitious in the way we want to achieve uh, our objectives, and our objectives are very much in concert with uh, what Veronica has stated. In fact, I had written down my, one of my way forwards is to reach out to Veronica to see how best we could uh, work closer. So uh, we are a five-year uh, project. Uh, we are in our third year now, uh, or is it second and a half year now? We are funded by the Ministry of Foreign Affairs of the Netherlands. Uh, we have um, three uh, consortium uh, partners. SNV uh, is, a, is a lead. Um, in consortium with uh, Wachnigen University, uh, CCAPS, AgriTerra, and Rabobank. Those institutions represent the various uh, competencies we, we wish to see uh, on the project. There's knowledge, uh, there's of course policy work, there's science in there, we have cooperative and we have financial, uh, financial institution. Uh, SNB role is primarily enterprise uh, development. Um, next. So our overall uh, goal, um, we, we are a multi-country uh, project. And so we operate in Kenya, Tanzania, and Uganda. Um, our objectives uh, are to uh, increase the availability of climate smart food for, uh, you know, for the populations of these three countries. Um, um, our objectives, specific objectives, of course, uh, resonate with, with why we are here. Uh, adoption of climate smart uh, practices amongst far farmers and specifically for uh, agro enterprises. And this is because we would like to see increased investments uh, in, 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 in climate, smart values, uh, climate smart value chains. Uh, and then we recognize that for us to do this in a sustainable manner, we, we need an enabling environment uh, that will ensure scaling uh, and at the same time, you know, support of, the, uh, of, of uh, policy and market driven uh, initiatives. Uh, next. So uh, each country, uh, remember I mentioned that uh, we are in three countries, each country has uh, different value chains, uh, but for Kenya, we are focusing on uh, potato, green grams, common beans, and, and, and sorghum. Uh, why these value chains? We believe that these value chains, uh, although they are um, low value and high volumes, they are extremely important to food security and at the same time have a bearing on, uh, on, in, on income prospects for our population. And so you look at our target groups, uh, we, we are looking at uh, entrepreneurial farmers. Uh, note here, entrepreneurial means those who invest for income. Um, then we see cooperatives. Uh, we have, of course, uh, SMEs. Um, we have service providers, um, financial institutions, and, and government. Uh, what is our approach? Um, if, you, if you look at the collection of stakeholders that we, we, we target specifically, uh, it's in, inherent in the project design that we foster an entrepreneurial community uh, of SMEs and farmers, whilst not forgetting, uh, you know, government and en enabling environment uh, that comes with it. Um, we, we are going to, we use a value chain approach, and that's why we picked these four value chains, which we felt we had a chance of have, having uh, the, the best influence on. Our solutions, uh, we don't prescribe any solutions. Uh, we, we, we actually use uh, our stakeholders, our partners to come up with solutions and then support them. Uh, very similar to a participatory approach, but we very consciously do not prescribe solutions. Um, similarly, we, we like to use the word inclusive business approach. Uh, why inclusive? Uh, because we are looking at women, we are looking at youth, we are looking at those initiatives that touch as many uh, parts of the demography uh, as we can. Um, next. Next. Good. So since we are talking about uh, investments, uh, we're going to focus on one key component on the project. And I would like to specify that the project uh, achieves all our objectives and all the approaches through two main uh, principles. One is uh, grant financing, and the second one is technical assistance. Uh, so today I'm going to talk about our Climate and Innovation and Investment Fund, uh, CIF. 
uh, and uh, explain how um, uh, uh, clients can uh, apply to it, uh, what it is purpose, uh, and how and how uh, uh, beneficiaries can can optimize its its objectives. Uh, so next. So. Um, for the past couple of uh, years, uh, we've been uh, trying to uh, bring on board different organizations that um, would benefit from pure grant funding. But we have a, a, a basic criteria. Uh, of course, the first criteria is the influence of this uh, business proposition uh, on uh, climate change. Uh, we look for solutions that, are resilient, that brings resilience, mitigation, and uh, adaptation to climate change. We also look at outreach. Uh, we want to reach as many uh, farmers as possible. Those are our ultimate uh, clients. Uh, similarly, food security. We want to also look at uh, food security brought about by uh, innovative uh, climate uh, practices and technologies. Uh, we also looking at income change. Remember, I also say that one of the things we want to achieve is income, sustained income uh, change. Um, we also want to look at job creation, and, and, and this, of course, bring in, brings in the entrepreneurial uh, perspective of the project. Uh, similarly, we, we have a, a part of the project that looks at affirmative action, looking at women. We are encouraging women to actually... Hello? Anyway, uh, so we are looking at women control over assets. Um, and so uh, my presentation basically a marketing tool to you all. If you know any women businesses, women owned or managed businesses that uh, deal in these staples that I mentioned earlier, uh, ask them to talk to us. Uh, we, we are kind of currently entertaining only just uh, two cases uh, from women owned enterprises, uh, actually three. And we'd like to see uh, that brought to 50% of the total uh, investments that we make uh, on the project. Uh, moving on. Next. So what is our primary investment tool? It's a business case. And what's a business case? A business case, as we all know, is uh, you know, a case for business. Do, if we invest in, in an initiative, uh, will it earn money? That's number one. Number two, will it reach the climate uh, objectives? Uh, what's uh, the value for money in the case? Uh, we examine profitability, of course, the commercial viability. We look at uh, different aspects. So an applicant must uh, reach uh, the items that are highlighted in, uh, in, in bold uh, on that slide. Hello, uh, we, want to, we want to look at the, the management. Oh, yeah, yeah. Uh, hello. hello, would you kindly uh, mute yourself um, if you're not speaking? Oh my God. Kindly mute yourself, you're interrupting Sebastian. Thank you. Sorry, Sebastian, please continue. Yeah, Catherine, I was going to say, uh, I was going to reach out to uh, Rakula and say, you know, hmm, I heard what he said, uh, you know, you should have more respect for women. But anyway, uh, so uh, we, we want to look at uh, scalability and systemic change. And this is one of the reasons why I'm, I'm thinking we really need to reach out to uh, Veronica and the MSP uh, members, because I believe that systemic change uh, requires that we, we have to work with other, other stakeholders. Uh, so that's what we look for in, in, in a business case. Um, uh, next. So we have a rather convoluted uh, process uh, before our funding uh, uh, is, uh, is released. Uh, first of all, we get an application. Uh, we, we, we already, of course, carried out value chain analysis, and that's why we know we are going to work in potatoes, common beans, sorghums, and sorghum and uh, green grams. Uh, you fill in a couple, the applicant will fill in a couple of forms. Uh, we screen all this, and at the end, we co-develop. Uh, um, uh, we co-create um, a business plan, and then we co-fund that business plan up to 50% of the value of that uh, business plan. Um, it's, uh, it can be a rather painful process, especially given that uh, our entrepreneurs and businesses uh, sometimes don't have those structures that we expect in a, a business that could be built to be resilient. Uh, moving on. 
Next, Laura. So, as I said earlier, we will invest up to 50% of a business plan. Um, and so we, we're looking at uh, certain criteria. Um, I will focus, uh, since I explained more about the criteria, I would like to look at the ticket size uh, and, the, and the time of the investment. We will invest up to 20 million uh, Kenya shillings uh, for a period of no more than uh, 2.5 ye uh, years. Um, but key to this is that the uh, application to us must be uh, market-led and commercially orientated, and that's number one. And secondly, it just must have uh, climate smartness. Uh, climate smartness here could be in manufacturing process, it could be in production processes, it could be in marketing, it could be in post-harvest handling, it could be in any other practice that could be considered uh, climate smart. Uh, uh, pay attention to the value chains. Uh, those ones are fixed. We cannot change that until we add, an, and, until and if we add another one. And then lastly, we must see the uh, clear contribution to uh, smallholder farmer uh, livelihoods. Uh, moving on. So I'll complete my presentation by uh, sharing uh, this. And I, I hope that I, I, I did justice to, to the market, marketing the project. Uh, if you know anyone uh, that would uh, fit the criteria shared above, uh, all they need to do is go online uh, to the sites uh, mentioned uh, on the presentation uh, ahead of you, uh, in front of you, and um, download those instructions. And if you have any questions, uh, shoot me an email. Uh, my email is down there, um, and we can begin the, the co-creation process. Laura, next. I think that's it. Uh, thank you so much. And I'm hoping that we will get some good applications uh, through you all. Thank you. OK, great. Um, great, Sebastian. Thank you very much for that um, enlightening presentation. And as we transition to the next panelist, um, we have some few questions for you, Sebastian. So kindly stay with us uh, so that you can respond. The first one, which I think you already mentioned in your presentation is, how socially inclusive is the market-led approach? And I know you talked about targeting uh, women and encouraging more women-led entrepreneurs or enterprises to join, but perhaps you can elaborate more, like are you reaching out to, you, to young people? Are you reaching out to um, the disabled? And you know, are you reaching out to other kinds of um, uh, uh, communities? And then we have another question from Bernard Kimoro. Uh, he asks, what are the mitigation interventions targeted and what sector subsectors sub are targeted? So mainly he wants to know the mitigation interventions. And finally, we have a question from Caroline Mongera, who would like to know, how do you qualify the innovative CSA practices and technologies? Um, so perhaps you can take just three minutes to respond to this, and then we can be able to move on to the next presenter. Uh, th thank you, Catherine. You know, we can take uh, forever to talk about these three issues. Uh, social yeah, inclusion <laughs> is, <laughs> yeah. So uh, as a general rule, SNB as an organization and all our partners uh, are specifically conscious of those uh, less endowed members of, uh, of the community. Um, and we will consciously go out to be uh, flexible to reach out to young people uh, and, uh, and the disabled and so forth. Uh, equity and equality is number one, uh, at least personally as an individual and as by extension SNB. So we, we consciously actually ask uh, business case uh, applicants to indicate to us, for instance, what percentage of persons will be youth, persons under the age of 35. Uh, we haven't entertained any uh, uh, applications from uh, disabled persons, but uh, please, please, if you have any, uh, send it over. We will go, we will use our technical assistance to make sure that we, we meet the requirements of this uh, demographic. Uh, in relation to subsectors, um, as we said, this is a, a market-driven uh, initiative. Which means, to, which means that uh, in all the respective value chains, we, the, the, the four value chains that I mentioned, we are willing to touch every single piece of those subsectors. I mean, if, if, uh, of, uh, of those value chains. I wouldn't call them subsectors, but if, for instance, uh, I mentioned things to do with post-harvest handling, 
uh, that's a piece of a value chain. Uh, I looked at uh, anything that brings social inclusivity, uh, access to finance uh, within those value chains. Because as we know, value chains uh, are made up of multiple players with multiple requirements. So that is our interest, sending a, a case that has that value proposition. It has climate smart practices, it reaches out to farmers and meets the objectives of the country and of the project, then we, we, we have a case. Uh, related to the last one on innovation, um, as we know, innovation is, uh, is a relative term. Uh, we have different kinds of innovation, process innovation, uh, product innovation, uh, recombinant innovation, and so forth. In our view, innovation means something that has not been used in an area before and it's currently being used or proposed to be used. Uh, I'll give you an example that we call an innovation, but it's not really an innovation. Uh, this is... Um, this is uh, to do with, uh, I'll give you an example of reaping services, you know, where to break the hard pans and so forth. It's not new. Uh, 30 years ago, you know, uh, 40 years ago, it was being used elsewhere. But it's not pervasive uh, in, 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 in our value chains. So for us to support, for instance, reaping services, we call that an innovation. Uh, if we find like there's a difference in a process, for instance, how inputs reach farmers, you know, instead of, uh, you know, the, the normal way of reaching farmers, if you use a digital platform, an ICT platform, we call that innovation and we would be interested in entertaining it. So I'm hoping uh, we have answered that question, but I would urge you to reach out to me separately. We can have a, a lengthier discussion uh, if you have, if I haven't answered your, your excellent question. Uh, thank you, Catherine. Um, thank you, Sebastian. We have quite a number of questions that have come in through the chat box for you. Um, but I think in the interest of time, let us allow the next uh, presenter to make his presentation. Uh, but mainly it's about the value chains. Uh, we have people asking about which value chains and there's someone, Robin Bay from the Ministry of uh, Agriculture requests or is asking whether the, the project uh, covers the livestock uh, value chain. And then also there's a question about the counties, but um, I think kindly take note of that, Sebastian, and during the closing remarks from our panelists, you can address some of these issues that have come in. Um, so for now, can uh, we have- A quick uh, one, uh, a quick one, Catherine, I may be, uh, I'm sorry yes. for this, but I, I may not stay on until the end. So these are very okay. uh, quick ones. I can, if you give me a minute, maybe I can uh, sort of just, giving a word and then uh, Robin and, uh, and, and, and Martin, we can continue the conversation. Is that okay, uh, uh, Catherine? I think it should be fine. Uh, it's the issue about the livestock. So maybe you can Great. comment briefly on that and then we move on. Excellent. So now, uh, Robin, livestock is uh, as, as a value chain uh, uh, is, is, is not part of our project. But, but this is what I always say, for instance, if someone was to come to us and say, we want to use sorghum for animal feed, you know, or something like that, and created a really, really good business case, then we would be impacting the value chain, uh, the livestock value chain. Uh, but not really, the, we will not be addressing the livestock value chain, but we will be using sorghum, which is one of our, our value chains, to address an issue in a different value chain. Uh, that, that is how I would look at it. So in terms, uh, I got also another question from Caroline, uh, and that's why I really want to reach out to Veronica. I would like to see how best we can support the MSP to reach out to counties more. I know this is something that the, the project has been trying to do, and I would like to uh, do that uh, better, even if it means some sort of uh, logistical support and so forth. Uh, Sogam uh, from Martin, uh, it's a very, very important value chain for us. Uh, we are studying what was uh, put in the budget this year, we know it, have mass, it has massive implication uh, on uh, how EABL, for instance, which is the main buyer for sorghum in Kenya, is, is, is going to uh, change its pricing structure. So uh, I would like us to have more uh, discussion on that. And, and thank you for bringing up uh, that issue. Uh, just to mention also that CCAF is also doing um, our, our policy work. And uh, I'm certain that uh, this is something we'll pick up and study more and possibly use the MSP as a, as a means of discussing uh, this issue. So uh, thank you so much, Catherine, for giving me additional time and thank you everyone for your question. Okay, um, thank you very much, Sebastian. 
And yes, we do have Jabo Sumba who is working with CCAFs and he represents the, you know, he works on the policy issues and he may be able to respond to one or two questions that may come in. Um, in the meantime, I would like to request Rakula kindly make your presentation um, in, in 10 minutes. Um, Rakula, you're, you're muted, unmute yourself. Um, and uh, will you be sharing your screen or is Laura going to do it for you? Mm, if she can do it for me. <laughs> Um, I wanted to do it myself, okay. but um, let's see. I'll okay, go. if you can do it yourself, kindly proceed. Just, uh, just proceed. Thanks. Okay, let me see this. Yeah. In the meantime, we encourage participants to continue to ask the questions through the Q and A. Uh, we realize if we allow, if we open it up for everyone to speak, we might have issues. <laughs> especially when we unmute, when we unmute ourselves, we might hear very interesting stories in the background. Um, so, um, Rakula, we're still waiting. Um, in the meantime, if you're having a challenge, um, Laura, are you able to show the, the, the presentation slides? Um, so, uh, Rakula, Laura is sharing your screen, uh, the, the, the slides, so perhaps you can unmute yourself and proceed. Okay, now, good uh, morning, everybody again. And uh, my name is Rakula Okot, working at uh, Solidaridad. I'm the impact investment and SME advisor for the region. And uh, today I'm, I'm introducing uh, one crowdfunding pl platform known as uh, Plus Plus. Uh, Plus Plus was launched this year, and it is uh, European-based. It is a conglomeration of uh, four NGOs that came together with uh, one organization that has um, experience on uh, uh, crowdfunding called Lenderhand. And uh, what Plus Plus does is that it mobilizes investors on a crowd platform to finance agri-businesses within uh, the region targeting specifically uh, SMEs dealing with the uh, agri produce, which can contribute to sustainable economic development. Can I go to the next slide? Now, down there, you can see the four organizations that are involved that came together and formed Plus Plus. That's ICCO, Solidaridad, uh, Lenderhand, and True Value, with Solidaridad and uh, ICCO being uh, the main shareholders for this. Uh, running the uh, crowdfunding platform. And these organizations that you see here have a lot of experience dealing with SMEs at different levels, in mainly in agribusiness, and also looking at the impact that uh, the SMEs have on the population and the climate, on the gender, and also on job creation. All the four NGOs have uh, that kind of experience. That's why they came together, because they have a common, common goal. The next slide, please. Now, how plus plus works. Uh, we finance SMEs through crowdfunding. What it means is that um, the SMEs can borrow from different investors. So when you have an SME that meets our criteria, which you are going to see uh, later on on the slide, then we take your SME and float it to a number of investors. And the investors, when they show interest on the kind of investments that, uh, the kind of uh, uh, work or business that you do, then we take the SME through the criteria that is needed by the, uh, the investors. Then we float your SMEs on the, on the platform. You can go to the next one. I'm summarizing everything so that I don't uh, go like read every, how Plus Plus finance uh, uh, the SMEs? This is what, number one, you must have a history of revenue. That means we don't go for startups. You can't come and tell us that uh, you have this good idea that you really want to showcase and uh, it has a lot of impact on climate, on women, on job creation, but you have never seen uh, uh, it work before. So 
plus plus does not deal with the startups that is one one of the rules because we base most of our uh, work on whatever you have done on the history and we look at the revenues even if it is small but we look at it and we look at the potential of it coming uh, if it has the potential for it to come we look at uh, your business model how are you planning to generate even the revenue are you really legally registered because we have realized that uh, there is a lot of what we call briefcase smes are uh, quite a lot and uh, we look at the legal registration the authenticity that you exist and uh, see if uh, you can really make impact on that so we go for existing smes our loan size is written down that about 10000 euros to 1 million euros so that means we go up to a maximum if you if we take it to equivalent kenya shillings over 110 million kenya shillings uh, maximum now impact is very important to to plus plus so we have to look at uh, whatever business are you doing does it handle the gender issues are you operating on improved agricultural practices those are the kind of impact we are talking about are you creating more jobs now all this that i'm addressing must be included on the business plan so that it shows what are what are you are how are you addressing the climate and environmental concerns are you having positive impacts on, on that that means if you are not having the positive impact if you're having negative impact on the environment and and climate then you are not one of our candidates among other things also we look at the un sdgs and the 70 SDGs that uh, uh, we all know if you kind of thing so it, it all gives you points on are you as this number of SDGs? how many are you covering also in addition to our key ones that uh, i've mentioned there the next one this now plus plus is unique in this sense uh, we don't ask for collateral because uh, we realize that most of the smes uh, do not have the collateral for that uh, that qualifies them to access finance from the local financial institutions and uh, we also realize that it is a bit awkward to to ask um, an sme that is operating maybe somewhere in the rural area most of the smes are based in the rural areas the land value there is very low compared to the land value in town and uh, they want for example an equivalent of 20 million kenya shillings or 10 million kenya shillings and the val land value in the rural area is um, that's what most of the smes use as a collateral because some of them don't even have vehicles they don't have enough machinery that can always uh, equate to the kind of uh, finance that they need that they can use that to secure it for the bank so we as plus plus decided that we we are not going to look at the collateral but we are going to do most of the uh, transaction based on trust based on the uh, financial statements and based on uh, the professional management that you have or not uh, the collateral. we look at the team that you have that you you are, you are expressing your business plan that you want to uh, move from point A to point B in your business, meeting our standards there. Uh, our uh, funds, uh, we, uh, we work up to a maximum of five years, 10 and now. And uh, just to mention on that, that uh, because we know that we are dealing with most of the SMEs that are based, agri-based, it is biannual. In other words, after every six months, that's when we, we look for payment. We don't pay monthly. I say we have an arrangement that you, we do after every six months that's because we are dealing with the uh, agri-based smes and we ask we understand the seasonality of most of the agri produced the interest rates are written there and it's very flexible sometimes we see that you want it on uh, at eight percent to ten percent sometimes six percent twelve percent and this is also very negotiable because um, the organizations that form plus plus have uh, ngo background and they understand the SME's challenges. So something which normally we talk about, but that is basically the range you can put at 10, depending on which organization we are dealing with. Let's go to the next one and we, we, we work on capital and cap, capex and that. Now this is the difference between uh, the banks and plus plus. 
the, the basic one. As we look at the good business plan that you have, the professional management, that means that do you have uh, a qualified accountant? Do you have uh, a, pa a person who is uh, uh, qualified in the kind of processing that you are doing? Or do you have a nutritionist if you are dealing with animals, with, with feed, with food? Or uh, are you dealing with uh, what is the technical capacity of your organization? Do you have professionals there or you have brought in people who are not going to manage the kind of uh, finance that you're going to get from us? Which on the other side, the banks do not necessarily look for that, but they look at, do you have a security to secure our, our money? They don't look at your, at, at your management. Um, we, ha we also offer mentorship to the SMEs and strategic advice. That means whatever is in the business plan, you have to sit down and agree, are you really taking the right path? And uh, we, can, we have expertise from different areas, from different regions in our different uh, uh, regional offices all over the world. If you are working on something on tea or coffee or even uh, spices then we can get expertise from our large network to give you mentorship on that if it is on finance if it is on accounting it's on technical it's, we all we, we we offer that to kind of those are the kind of um, uh, strategies we have so that it it, it um, buffers the, the finance that we that we offer and uh, this is offered to the dutch crowd and uh, the disbursement is dependent on the interest from the crowd that uh, likely to fund the disbursement. You can go to the next one. To apply on the platform, we need the basic documentation first to conduct a first check. That means if we, if you are an SME and you are interested in our platform, we need a financial statement, not bank statement. Finance. That means like audited accounts for one to five years. If you have operated for two years, we need for two years, you operated for three years, but we need uh, the audited accounts. We need a good business plan, which explains what is number three, what you want to use it for, and also the financial focus. And the company management, that's like a repetition of what has happened. We, we need those first and the business plan, then we start working from there, the next step, doing the due diligence. And go to the next one. Uh, I won't forget to mention uh, <coughs> the P4G, Partners for Green Growth, which uh, Partner for Green Growth, go just go to the next slide, slide as I explained. The Partner for Green Growth uh, is an organization that has injected the initial funds for Plus Plus to be set up. For example, the launching, the official launching, which is being done in the Netherlands and the one which was done in, uh, at the Sankalp, there was a pre-launch in Kenya. So Plus Plus, uh, P4G was, um, is also one of our quasi partners who is, uh, in, has injected some funds on the four organization to set up all this platform, to bring in all the, uh, um, the staff, and they, they have targeted this country, so Kenya is one of them. And uh, we work together, and also they handle our relationship with the, the government because P4G works a lot with the, the government of all these countries that uh, you see here. And that's why I have to mention about it there. For Kenya, we focus on agriculture SME digital financing platform because. Uh, how Plus Plus works is that we upload, we onboard your SME information because you have an intake form on a platform. It's mainly digital so that uh, it, it's exposed to all these investors and it goes through points. And uh, it's, it's, a, it's, it's basically a digitized kind of uh, platform that has a uh, uh, only us as the local people, we only do the due diligence. Then when we onboard it, then it goes, it's on the digital platform, which is exposed to many investors and it gathers points and uh, the interested investors can relate questions also digitally to different SMEs to see the viability of uh, the project. So this plays an important role during this and thank you for your 
for your time. I think I've moved fast enough. Thank you very much. Um, thank you, thank you, Rakula. Um, I realize we are running out of time, so yeah. I think let's just let's take all the questions uh, after after the remaining two presentations. Uh, but just note that we have Jacob Sanga, and he says he's, he's a youth group. He's representing a youth group, and they're doing coffee farming, and he's interested in more information. So, and there was also a question about their presentations. Yes, we are going to uh, collect the presentations. And we are going to share the presentations as well as the recording um, to all our attendees so that you may be able to interact with them further and also reach out to the resp respective speakers should you need uh, further information. So for now, we are going to have Geoffrey Musioki from Eco Credit, um, who will be sharing how they are financing uh, CSA interventions and other agriculture related um, measures in, in the country. So um, Geoffrey, take over. Yeah, thank you. Um, let me say good morning uh, in this part of the world. And thanks for this opportunity to discuss what EcoCredit is doing and uh, how we can work together. So um, I'm, I'm alive to the idea, uh, to the issue of time, but I will try to take a short time as possible. But we have enough time after the after the conference call, you can reach out to me directly. We can have uh, more detailed and more focused uh, discussions. So I work for EcoCredit International uh, based in Nairobi, uh, but at the moment we are all working from home. So I'm calling you from Makweni County, that is. Um, so today I'll, I know most of you may not have heard about uh, EcoCredit, and I know two people cannot work together if they don't know each other. So I'm alive to that idea. And also I'll introduce you to what EcoCredit is doing with regard to agriculture and also with regard to climate smart um, agriculture. So um, the slides could be pretty brief, but ideally EcoCredit is an international lender. It's what we call an, it's in the class of impact investors. And it's also, um, a wholesale lender in that case. So we, we, pro we provide funding to other lenders. We provide lending to microfinance institutions. We provide lending to circle societies. We provide wholesale lending to other local banks for own lending. And that could be one of the reasons you may not have heard about us because we don't lend to individuals. We don't do retail uh, lending. And uh, just in brief, oiko refers to an ancient Greek word, means house, homestead, community, all the world. So oiko is not a Luo word. I think most of us could think that uh, this is a Western Kenya name, but uh, oiko is a Greek word, means a household, communities, and credit uh, down there. Credit down there really means uh, we're believing in, uh, it's com coming from a Latin verb, uh, credere, which means to believe. So oiko credit is pronounced as one word. We don't, we don't pronounce that as oiko. It's uh, oiko credit that uh, means we believe in households, we believe in communities, and we believe in, uh, in the rural communities to a large extent. So that's a brief of uh, what oiko credit stands for. Uh, so that at least we have uh, an idea of, of that. And we have a vision, and the vision is to ensure that the world can share the resources that are available. We get our funding from uh, developed worlds. We, we get our funding from uh, largely from Europe, from the US, from Australia, and we are able to invest these funds in developing markets, in developing countries. So that's in the spirit of sharing, that uh, the developed world can share with the developing world, and that way everyone can live a life of dignity. And the mission we have uh, is to provide financial services and support organizations to improve the quality of life for low-income people and communities in a sustainable way. Sorry. So ideally, the idea is to ensure that the world can share and the sharing is from uh, the developed to the developing world. And the, the focus is to ensure that the low-income people and communities can 
improve in terms of uh, quality of life. Briefly about our financing, um, and these are numbers as at 31st March, we do our accounts quarterly. Uh, we have uh, 685 uh, partners in 65 countries, and the total portfolio by then was like uh, 100, uh, 1,000 million uh, euros. That's more or less like uh, 114 billion Kenya shillings or thereabout, but across the 65 countries. In terms of uh, locations, we are in uh, 15 countries where we have regional and country offices, as uh, seen in that uh, map uh, where we have the 33 focus countries. And also, a brief, uh, I'll briefly discuss about the focus sectors in the subsequent slide. But from that picture, you'll see an element of financial inclusion where we have the dollars, we have agriculture where, where we have the folk jembe and we have a renewable energy uh, where we have that uh, socket and plug. And again, uh, all this is just to let you know who your credit is. Uh, and the idea is that we know who you are working with uh, for purposes of uh, close um, collaboration. In terms of uh, global uh, distribution, you see we have much of our investments in uh, Latin America. We have a lot also in Asia. We also have quite a bit in Africa and other countries uh, with around 5% of, of the 1,000 uh, million, or 1 billion uh, euro uh, or equivalent in whichever currency. By sector, we have investments in uh, financial inclusion and that's around almost 80% as at today. And that includes wholesale uh, lending to other banks, wholesale uh, lending to microfinance banks, Wholesale we'll lending to microfinance institutions, the circle societies, and that takes much of our investments. We also have uh, investments in agri, and that's where I come in. Uh, that's around 20% uh, now. It was around 16% uh, uh, by the end of March. And your uh, renewable energy is fairly new, uh, where we now have around 5%. And 1% is in other activities like um, health services. Uh, constructions for schools, which, uh, which we may not be doing for now. That is uh, an older portfolio uh, for the previous years. If I can move faster, we do both equity uh, investments and loans. 86% uh, of our investment is in direct loans and 14%, which we intend to grow to almost 30% in the next two or three years, is going to be equity where we can buy ordinary shares in your business. And we can also partner with you in terms of capacity building. Uh, we can second a director or um, uh, to your board. That way we can strengthen your capacity, I mean your, your governance uh, structure and uh, the quality of decisions within your, your management. Uh, briefly, uh, this is uh, where we were in terms of uh, distribution per country. Kenya is appearing somewhere which means we have a bit of work to do. We have to work with a, a lot more of you so that we can progress. India is currently holding much of our, much of our portfolio. Uh, Uganda, Rwanda, uh, right after El Salvador, um, in that order. Again, uh, since you get this presentation, I think you can spend time in it and see where we could credit, uh, where our partners are globally. We have some even in Madagascar a bit in uh, East Africa and Southern Africa, and also a bit in West Africa, and also in Egypt, uh, Senegal as well. You'll see a lot in Asia, a lot in uh, Latin America, where we have uh, developing markets. Again, I think that's uh, briefly about that. So um, in, uh, in terms of country offices, in Africa, where I want to mention is that uh, we have a country of the, the regional office for Africa is in Kenya. And uh, we have a hub in uh, Cote d'Ivoire, Ghana, and, uh, and Nigeria. Um, so I would want again to spend a minute in sharing the eco-credit investment cycle. If you look at the sourcing, we get our monies from uh, Europe, from Canada, from uh, US. When we get that funds, we, we are able to advance in terms of loans, uh, either to financial institutions or to agriculture. So once you have that money, you are able to pay it back and it's a revolving kind of uh, a resource. So it's not a grant mainly, it's a loan 
once the SEMI is paid back, it's able to reach out to, to other, other um, deserving uh, uh, projects. So once you get this, you look at it where you have a question, I'll be more than willing to, to take you through. In terms of agriculture, we have a theory of change and our long-term objective is to ensure that we improve the, uh, the, the livelihood of smallholder farmers or rural income households and community, communities. So that's the focus for agri, in, uh, for agri investments in EcoCredit. The target is the smallholder farmer. We understand there are challenges about the uh, sustainability of smallholder farmers, but uh, we know that the large scale farms are able to get uh, funding from the local banks. So we are able to reach the large scale farms through our lending through other banks. But for the smallholder organizations, we realize there is a challenge and that's why we are focusing uh, solely on the smallholder uh, organizations. And the long-term objective is to improve their, uh, their living income. But uh, to get to that long-term objective, the short-term objective is to ensure that we, uh, we help these institutions to improve on uh, farm productivity, uh, get uh, a greater crop diversification, farm resilience through climate smart agriculture. So we are very keen to support projects that uh, encourage or work under the climate smart agriculture space. We have uh, a number of uh, uh, products that we offer down here, but I have a slide that looks at, uh, at those, uh, at those uh, items. But in brief, we have the short-term working capital trade finance loans. We have long-term investment loans. Crop renovation is, for example, where you have old coffee trees and you want to plant afresh. Either you had the old varieties of SL28, but now you want to plant the Royal 11. It takes some time for you to start harvesting. So we are able to offer that patient capital that can wait for the two or three years for the crop to be ready. I also want to spend some time and mention what uh, we do in terms of focus crops. Uh, I'll avoid the other countries globally, but focus on where I've highlighted, Kenya, Uganda, and Rwanda. And this says that our focus countries in this part of the world is uh, Kenya, Uganda, and Rwanda. And of late, uh, these are these data from end of March, but of late, I'm now able to, to look at uh, investments in Zambia and Malawi. And the focus crops involve coffee, macadamia, tea, and maize. If you look at uh, the first three, these are more of international value chains. We are aware that our local partners in terms of uh, local microfinance institutions, the local banks, they are able to work on the local value chains to a large extent. But because of our global spread, we are able to support local uh, cooperatives, local organizations to do international trade. And uh, that's why you see us largely in coffee, macadamia, and tea, which involves uh, global value chains. Because of our presence in Europe, we are able to work directly with uh, the buyers, and that way we can have the triangulated kind of payment as securities for the loans. We have other focus crops in other parts of the world, the cocoa, cashew, uh, fruits and vegetables, and also dairy. Uh, you'll realize that before last year, sorry, before last year we were doing virtually everything, I remember we started with Gidunguri Dairy from the scratch until uh, we are happy that they are now big enough to work on their own. And that really forms our pride that we're able to start with an organization, develop them in terms of capacity building to a level that they can work on their own. But as I said, we can discuss this uh, offline as well. So this I think is more interesting to you as to which products we are working on. And the first one is trade finance. This works uh, more like an overdraft facility. This is a kind of money that you withdraw when you need it. Uh, if you don't need it, you just pay back. So you only pay interest during the time that you are using and only for the amount that you are using. And as Oiko Credit, we prefer to do long-term investments so, and also long-term partnerships. So these loans, the least amount of uh, time we invest is three years. So even if it's an overdraft, it will be for three years, uh, which is renewable annually. And that way within those three years, we can be able to partner together, develop your capacity. By the end of three years, you should be an organization that can, um, can survive or weather the storms in the market. The next facility is working capital loans. 
this is more like uh, the everyday um, activities uh, financing for your organization. The difference between this and the first one is that uh, the first one is more like an overdraft, but working lo capital loan you pay over a period of time with equal installments. So these payments are largely coming from your profits. Unlike in the first one, where you can even you pay back the capital that we've given you. But for working capital loans, you pay from your profits. By the end of the period, you are left with that particular loan amount to proceed on your own. Asset finance, these are fixed assets. Uh, this one is for items like warehouses, machinery, equipment, buildings, uh, any kind of infrastructure and are likely to be long-term in nature. This can extend up to seven years uh, in terms of loan with a, a grace period for the implementation period. As I said, we do have a crop renovation or rehabilitation. Uh, this is a bit long-term. For example, if you want to plant a new uh, tea, a, a new tea plantation, a new uh, uh, coffee plantation, or you want to cut down your tea, uh, old tea, old uh, tea or coffee uh, plantation, so that it can rejuvenate. It may require a bit much longer of a time for you to start paying. So that's why it's a unique uh, uh, offering that we have. And the last one is equity investments. We have uh, staff in our office that work on equity investments. On my part, I do look at the loan investments or uh, debt instruments. I want to mention briefly about uh, the criteria. This differs from enterprise to enterprise. I just took uh, the key issues. Uh, the range of our loans is from uh, 50,000 uh, euro or USD. And if you convert to Kenya shillings, that could be around uh, 5 million Kenya shillings. And we can go all the way to 10 million euro or 1 billion Kenya shillings. That means that we can grow with you for a very long time and support you until you are stable enough not to borrow again. Uh, we also do consider a triple bottom line. That's uh, to say that we look at social sustainability, uh, economic sustainability, and environment sustainability. We, the, the project must pass uh, those three uh, criteria. We could, uh, when we talk of social sustainability, is that we want to know what impact does your project have to the local communities? Are you providing a market for the rural hold? Uh, smallholder farmers? Are you providing input? Are you offering trainings? Um, are you providing employment for the local communities? In terms of economic sustainability, we are saying that the project has to at least be sustainable. It has to be profitable. If you've not been able to break even, at least uh, your projection should show that in the next one year or so, you should be able to be profitable. And you will realize that if a project is not economically profitable, it may not survive for long. And the last item is environmental sustainability. We don't, project, we don't support projects that are damaging the environment in any way. And that's why we work with the certification organizations for like rainforest, organic certifications, fair trade certifications. These are certifications that are very keen to monitor the environmental impact of your project. Again, we also do the environment impact assessment uh, for your project and also uh, do an audit for that report to show that it meets a uh, quality criteria. So we, re we realize that your project has a mandivas uh, impact on the environment. It's unfortunate we'll not be able to support it. And these are things that we'll discuss uh, with you directly if, if we get to work together. We are very flexible in terms of securities. We can use stocks as security. We, if the properties are there, if we can use triangulated payments with the buyers, we at times even use contracts as securities. So we are fairly flexible uh, to ensure that we can reach out to those that are not able to benefit from the local markets. Repayments are based on cash flows. We are very keen to look at your cash flow projections. If your cash flow say that you're able to pay monthly, we will go for it. If it shows you're able to pay quarterly or annually, we are able to work with that. But we are very keen to look at your assumptions and comb through your projection to make sure that they make sense. And again, as I mentioned, we prefer long-term relationships. These are projects from three years, investments from three years and beyond. Any other criteria is dependent on the enterprise. If you are in tea, the requirements will be different. If you are in coffee, the requirements may be different, but we are able to discuss that uh, 
Other basic requirements are three audited uh, account statements. Uh, collateral, if it's available, we may go for professional valuation. Uh, memorandum, and these are basic items that we believe each business has. And uh, we have an application that we share with you, the business plan that uh, Rakula mentioned, a strategic plan in that case. And if you have, uh, you are dealing with trade finance, you'll ask for supply contracts. And KYC documents relates to uh, registration certificates, IDs for the directors and managers, and any other project related uh, documents. I'm aware of time issues. Allow me to yeah. rush through. I was yeah. just about to tell you, Geoffrey, to kindly wind yeah. up or rush yeah. through the yeah. slides because we still have. Actually, this is the last one. Okay, thanks, please. Thank you. Yeah, so Thank you. we are working on very unusual times under COVID 19. So, what we are doing now is uh, we are supporting our existing borrowers, whether they when they need the funding, uh, emergency funding, so that they can survive the crisis. And we're also able to support them with their trainings and business continuity plans during this time, a scenario and stress testing models so that they can manage their cash flow as well during this time. And with regard to new borrowers, uh, what we are doing now is to look at their documentation, prepare the proposal, submit, but uh, approval will happen once a uh, COVID crisis has been uh, contained. So that's the end. I know uh, I, it's very short time for me to discuss Oiko Credit, uh, but I'll open it up for direct communication. I had uh, shared my email and my telephone number in the first um, the first slide for follow up discussion. Sorry a lot for sorry for taking more of your time. Thanks. Um, it's okay. Thank you very much, Geoffrey. And just to encourage you to look at the Q&A chat box, there's some questions that have come in for you. So you can take some time to respond already. And like you said, you've shared your contact details. So our members and our attendees will follow up with you directly should they require further information. Um, I'd also like to point out that for those who are on Twitter, we have a hashtag Kenya CSA MSP, CSA MSP is in caps. Um, kindly tweet about the meeting and um, yeah, create some buzz around this. So our next speaker is going to be Federico Lande. He's from Financial Access. Um, Federico, you have ten minutes. I am sorry, but I I hope you'll be able to to keep to keep to time. Otherwise, we may just cut you off. But anyway, no. Um, just try to keep to time so that we can we can wind up by midday as we had prepared for. Thanks. Yes, that's great. Thank you. Um, just making sure that you can all see my screen. Yes, we can. Okay, great. Thanks. And thanks for inviting Financial Access to speak uh, in this panel. I'll try my best to uh, keep it within 10 minutes. Um, the first thing I would like to say, yeah, we've had uh, uh, quite a broad range of organizations uh, in this panel, uh, NGOs and investors. Um, and I guess uh, Financial Access is not really neither of them. We're not an NGO. We're not a an investor, but we work together with NGOs and with investors and other parties uh, to leverage uh, and to scale uh, finance uh, uh, in agriculture value chains in, uh, in, in Africa and Asia. Um, so we have a little bit of a hybrid beast. So the first part of my uh, presentation, I really would like to try to explain uh, where we come from. Uh, financial Access is part of the Financial Access Group. Uh, we were part of the of ING Bank. Uh, and back in 2007, uh, we, we split and uh, we, we became our own entity, but basically our DNA is very much in the banking world. Um, we started uh, doing uh, advisory uh, assignments for large uh, banks or financial institutions or microfinance institutions globally. Uh, typical uh, assignments uh, were, for example, uh, setting up risk management systems, process optimization, or even strategy implementation, especially in the space of uh, agri-finance. And that we've basically done for over 20 years, starting from the 1990s. Uh, more recently, we turned our attention uh, uh, to uh, yeah, uh, agri-finance, uh, especially uh, in uh, uh, Africa and Asia, uh, where we basically work uh, providing both advisory services uh, for smallholder farmers, uh, as well as technology solutions for financial institutions, uh, microfinance institutions, to be able to bridge the financing gap that exists in these uh, value chains. Um, we have, we are, uh, have a headquarter in Amsterdam, but we also have uh, regional offices in uh, Nairobi, uh, Jakarta. 
Um, so just uh, briefly, a little bit of our track record. As I said, we work both with financial institutions and, uh, and smallholders. That is basically uh, our approach. Um, we, we have completed uh, more than 300 assignments uh, you know, from the 1990s working with banks, but also working with other parties such as NGOs uh, in uh, various landscapes. We, we have experienced uh, over 45 countries. Uh, our emphasis at the moment is really on Africa and Southeast Asia. And we've also worked uh, along multiple value chains, uh, including cocoa, coffee, rubber, coconut, etc. Um, so why why are we here? Um, the reason, of course, this is really uh, preaching to the choir. Of course, we all know about the the definancing uh, gap faced by smallholders, uh, which is uh, quite uh, you know ironic to think because uh, yeah, most of the food production. Uh, comes from smallholders and at the same time we know that uh, climate change results in particular issues for smallholders as well uh, and you know lowering agricultural production. Um, so basically what we do is we try to work uh, on two sides. The first side is with smallholders and basically we have developed an approach uh, where we uh, what our, 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 our aim is basically to create an, an investable portfolio of smallholders that we can then link to uh, financial institutions, uh, for example, microfinance uh, institutions, uh, and we basically do the credit scoring for them. So we basically uh, work with farmers. We, we 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 try to see what data is available in a certain uh, landscape, um, and we see okay, we, we do our credit scoring, and we we basically try to find which uh, farmers uh, are bankable, and so that we can bring uh, form and basically um, uh, group them in an investable portfolio, and then bring them to a financial institution. At the same time, on the other hand, uh, bringing uh, farmers to an institution uh, is not enough. Financial institutions basically are facing specific problems in uh, trying to get into uh, smallholder finance, one being high operational costs and risks, of course. So on, on that front, we leverage our experience working with financial institutions, understanding their uh, bottlenecks, their challenges, um, so we provide advice to them, and then we have also created in-house a fintech platform that can allow these financial institutions to scale their uh, agri lending while at the same time lowering their costs and their risks. Um, so basically, this is a little bit what I what I've said already. Perhaps uh, uh, to add, um, we also uh, work uh, with uh, to scale. We are uh, investment advisors for to scale, so uh, I think most most of you uh, are familiar with them. And we work with it's basically a, a, an, a, an accelerator, and we work with their uh, portfolio of companies, uh, agri businesses, uh, on capacity building, and at the same time to help them uh, basically raise capital. So we we work with them throughout the whole process of structuring investments with uh, in, uh, impact uh, investors. Uh, from the due diligence all the way down to uh, structuring and uh, disbursement. A little bit about our, our work that we do with smallholders. Um, these are all the steps, however, just the, the, the main story uh, is, is basically what we do is uh, we try to find um, uh, basically aggregation points where there is already data available on farmers and that's where our partnerships with NGOs is particularly important because a lot of NGOs work uh, for many years with these farmers. Uh, sometimes they may even have some uh, unofficial lending programs. However, this data is not really uh, being leveraged at the moment. And that's where we come in. Uh, we look at this data and we try to develop uh, credit risk uh, models. And credit risk models, of course, are not new in this space, but I what really sets us, sets us apart is that we, of course, we, are, we come from a banking background. Uh, for, for us, what is important is really to understand the cash flow generation capacity uh, of farmers. Uh, other cash um, credit uh, assessment providers may be looking also at uh, more uh, in fintech data, for example, uh, uh, such as, for example, PESA data. But I, I think that that is, that is nice, but in the end, what really drives uh, credit worthiness is uh, its cash flows. And that's basically what we try to do in our approach. It might be worth mentioning at this stage. Um, that uh, in, in doing this, there are a few possibilities to partner with other uh, in organizations. So for example, uh, by doing our credit assessment, we can also see uh, if a farmer is not immediately bankable, we can actually do almost a diagnostic, you can think about it, um, where we see which areas, uh, where are the gaps uh, for this farmer? Uh, is it about uh, financial literacy or is it about a gap in agricultural practices? 
And at that point, we can work with NGOs to, to, to basically see whether they can provide capacity building, specifically on those aspects that we saw were a bit lacking during the assessment. And in a second stage, um, you would be able to, to make this, this pharma bankable. And that would basically also drive uh, the scaling of, of this exercise. And talking about uh, climate smart agricultural practices, that's also something that we can do uh, to in include in this, uh, in this exercise um, by partnering with uh, organizations and to identify, okay, what are some of the practices that are needed? Uh, we can also uh, basically de-risk the portfolio for the financial institutions because with better practices, you say the, the risk, of course, goes down. At the same time, um, we also uh, uh, tweak our credit assessment models uh, because basically if uh, for any um, kind of um, yeah, practice that you add uh, for the farmer that you, that you propose, that has an impact, of course, on the, on the ability for the farmer to, to generate cash. So, so for example, agroforestry uh, systems will, 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 will lead to a different, uh, you know, to changes to the cash generation capacity of a farmer. At the same time, it also uh, very much uh, has an impact on the kind of uh, uh, financing product that the farmer needs. And that can also be taken into account once we reach these financial institutions that we work with. So the final step is really uh, reaching the financial institutions and uh, presenting this uh, uh, portfolio of farmers. Um, of course, it's a final step, but in, the, in, in reality, what we do is always we try to do it uh, all in parallel. So that when, once we start working with farmers, we also start engaging the financial institution uh, immediately so that we can make sure that once we uh, bring this portfolio to them, it, it also makes sense for them from the, from the point of perspective of the KYC requirements or other processes so that we are all aligned uh, since uh, from the beginning. And the, the final step, of course, is that we also work with impact investors because in the end, uh, we want this, this scheme to be uh, scalable and to rely on uh, private funds. Um, in the beginning, of course, we work with donors. It also very much depends on the level of, of sophistication already with the farmers. If there's already a lot of data, already NGOs have been working for a long time, then uh, donor money will, will basically be uh, a lot less. But in, in other cases, when there is not a lot, and you really need to work with on capacity building, uh, then of course you rely more on donors. Um, on the last part of our approach, that is once you have you generated this portfolio of farmers, uh, you can bring it to a financial institution, but that in itself does not solve the, the specific issues that these uh, institutions are facing. And I come from, a, from an impact investor uh, background that I work a lot with financial institutions and understanding really the challenges that they face in terms of high operational costs that makes it very costly uh, to engage in smallholder financing um, and also very high risk. So what we've done here at uh, Financial Access is that we've developed our own fintech platform to be able to solve also that part of the puzzle. Um, Land Access, we've, we've, uh, we've launched it recently. It's basically, uh, yeah, it's a modular solution is a low cost as a SaaS solution. So it's basically a highly modular. Uh, as I explained in, in, a, in a few seconds, uh, there are a few different modules that we provide for financial institutions that integrates uh, with, uh, with any financial institution, uh, you know, regardless of the, the specific systems they're already using. The first uh, module is a data collection module, what we call an access collect. It's basically allowing financial institutions to do their data collection uh, in the field digitally. So we have an, we're providing an app uh, which loan officers can basically bring with them uh, on a tablet and basically gather data uh, all in, uh, in the tablet through a questionnaire that is already set uh, in the tablet. At the same time, a loan officer can also uh, track GPS location, take pictures, but also uh, upload documents. Um, and basically this is bringing uh, cost efficiency uh, to the typical process of having to onboard customers. Um, and at the same time, it also guides in uh, loan officers uh, showing impact, uh, you know, uh, specific metrics on their performance and uh, so making this process even more um, efficient. Um, the, la the, the second part is the loan origin origination. So once, once basically a loan has, the, the loan officer has identified uh, potential, ca potential customers, we then have developed a whole workflow that is completely digital for people uh, working in a branch where they can basically uh, yeah, approve this loan depending on the kind of uh, processes that they have already in place. So you can also set different uh, user hierarchies. And uh, we see that this uh, 
contributes to uh, reducing credit uh, turnaround time and also further uh, increasing operational efficiency. Uh, the other one is credit risk assessment. That's basically what I touched upon. Uh, that is also something that we use with our uh, smallholder farmers. We basically uh, uh, create uh, credit uh, risk models for financial institutions to invest in smallholders. Um, and it's also possible with these models uh, to, for an institu institution to see specifically under which area uh, a farmer may, 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 may have gas, for example, so that even the financial institution can see, okay, perhaps we need to, to work on capacity building on these areas so that this person could become a customer uh, shortly in the future. Um, yeah, and uh, last is something that we are currently piloting uh, in Ghana. Um, of course, one of the major risks of uh, yeah, uh, agriculture financing is the impact of climate change and, uh, and the climate risk. So you can think of floods or also risk of fire. So what we are now doing is, is we're partnering with satellite data uh, companies providing satellite data and images <clears throat> to be able to see um, whether, how we can <clears throat> basically introduce these risks uh, in the in the portfolio to, uh, in the portfolio of these financial institutions, so that these financial institutions can actually track this risk and understand what kind of risks, uh, climate risks they are uh, facing uh, in their portfolio, and basically this can also give an early warning for default for the climate, for the financial institution. Uh, yeah, I think uh, this brings me to the end of the presentation. I hope I <laughs> managed uh, in time. Um, Happy to, of course, uh, receive more questions. Uh, you can uh, get in co contact with me or any of my colleagues uh, here. Uh, and uh, yeah, thank you very much. Okay, great. Thank you very much, Federico. Um, that was a very interesting presentation. Uh, we do have some questions coming in through the chat box. So um, can we go through and see which one is relevant? And I, I want to thank each of the panelists who've already responded to the questions as they've been coming in. And um, yeah, so our next uh, presenter is going to be Laura Kramer from CCAFS. And um, she'll be talking about the policy work that MSP has been doing because in order to have an enabling environment to, to finance CSA investments in Kenya, we do need to engage more in terms of policy. So I'll invite Laura to share some of the initiatives that the MSP has been undertaking so far. Thank you. Thanks, Catherine, and good morning, everyone. Uh, it's great to see a lot of familiar names in the attendee list and also some, um, some new names as well. So I have to share my screen here. Let me just do that. Um, Okay, is everyone seeing my, my slides? I'll yes. see brief. Okay, great. Slide share. Okay, yeah, so the, the four pr uh, previous presenters were organized by thematic working group number three on investments. I'm coming to you representing thematic working group four on policy engagement, and Veronica had uh, detailed those uh, four working groups in her intro presentation, and we will share the presentations uh, with everyone afterward. So for working group four, we're, we're supposed to do kind of knowledge gathering and policy engagement. And one of our first activities is we've been working on a policy brief, and we've decided um, this is just our, our objective and our activities here. So uh, we're supposed to facilitate dialogue and then organize roundtable for a, with policymakers. So one of the first things we're doing is this policy brief. And we've said that, you know, for those of you who have been to our in-person MSP meetings, uh, you know that the topic of how to engage the counties comes up every time. And so what we want to do with this policy brief is have a product that we can use to go um, talk with counties, either directly or through the Council of Governors or through JASCOM, and really highlight to them what kind of actions uh, they can take to promote CSA. And so we had presented, I think, at our previous in-person meeting, I can't remember when that was, uh, but we had presented an outline, we've worked on it, we have a draft ready, 
And uh, it's four pages right now, and we have some concrete recommendations that I'll present here, and then I'll invite uh, other people or e everyone on this call, if you want to make comments, I will make it available. So the main sections that we have, we put the key messages up front, and then uh, we have an introduction on how the changing climate is affecting agriculture here in Kenya. Then we talk about how CSA can address that challenge, the opportunities for counties to scale up CSA, and then the recommendations with more details um, based on what the key messages are. And so these key messages that come right up front, the first one, of course, is that climate change is an added challenge to, you know, there already is a long list of challenges facing the agriculture sector in Kenya. Um, and then the, the next message is that CSA, of course, can help farmers cope with these negative impacts and improve national food security at the same time. And the counties, uh, through their devolved function in agriculture, can help promote CSI, CSA uh, by developing policies and strategies and allocating budget to those, um, those activities to foster CSA. That budget allocation, I think, is really critical. The stimulate, then stimulating value chains and markets um, using CSA practices. And you know, we have some really nice examples um, here from, from the investors who have just presented on what some of those, uh, some of those opportunities are. So maybe linking up um, counties and, and farmers can help stimulate that. And then we've been talking about how do we get the CSA um, multi-stakeholder platform established at county level. So uh, another recommendation is having those county level um, MSPs established so that they can share information and then offering advisory services through uh, existing extension agents or e-extension uh, and other means to, to farmers cooperatives, especially women and youth organizations. So we have the draft ready. Um, there's a, a shot there on the left of the first page of it, and you see I've um, numbered the lines uh, to make it easier to collect feedback. So instead of sending out a Word doc and having um, 20 people send in tracked changes, we thought it would be easier to have a form. So I have a, an Excel form to collect feedback. So for each section, people can type in uh, what comment they have, what lines it refers to, or what page it's on. And that way we can uh, collect that feedback and improve it because um, you know, we did it as, as our thematic working group, but we want to get some buy-in from the larger MSP as well. And so we'll make this available and uh, I'll send it out after this meeting. And if everyone who wants to uh, can send in the filled comment form to my email, that's l.cramer at cgir.org by the 8th of July, then we can improve the text and move it forward. So the next steps then uh, after this are to collect those comments by the 8th of July and you know, we can't act on all of them. Uh, some will probably be contradictory, some might make it too long, some might take it off course, but those that we can incorporate and that keep it on course and contribute to uh, the key messages, those uh, we can put into the final version and then we'll ask the steering committee to approve that final text, hopefully by the end of July. We'll look for a graphic designer to give it a, a nice professional look. And so if anyone here on this call is a graphic designer or has skills or knows someone who can um, help us with that, uh, it would be great to hear from them. And after that, once it's finalized, what we are suggesting is that once in-person meetings resume, and I hope it's soon, uh, that we present it at a meeting of JASCOM or the Council of Governors, as I had mentioned, in collaboration with Veronica and the Climate Change Unit. Um, and I, I think even on the call, we have some representatives from those bodies here. So that's kind of the first step. And then I know we have members within the national MSP who are working at county level, so we can even work with you to also go direct to specific counties where you're active and possibly also present it there. Uh, so that's 
the end of my presentation. I never talk very long, Catherine. So I'll hand it uh, back over to you. I'll stop sharing my screen. And thank you very much. Okay, thanks. Thanks very much, Laura. Um, perhaps we can have the, the master slide now on the screen. Um, because I don't think our next uh, presenter has a PowerPoint presentation. Uh, but just uh, in terms, of, I just have one announcement. We, we are trying to take a record of um, our attendees and participants in order to follow up later. And we have two who have registered as one is OPPO and the other one is 4JAUC3, something like that. Would you kindly um, share your full names and email address on the chat box so that we can be able to add you to the mailing list? Um, so thank you very much to all our panelists so far, and thank you for taking time to respond to the questions that are coming in through the, the chat box. And for any that will remain pending, we shall be able to find a way to respond. So if you put your question along with your name and uh, and um, email address, whoever it's addressed to will be able to respond to you. Um, so I would like now to invite Nancy Rapando. Nancy is a, is a very critical member of the multi-stakeholder platform. She's part of the steering committee and she's been you know, providing us with energy to keep the MSP uh, going. And she's going to give us uh, some wrap up comments, some closing remarks, and, and, and also, um had some 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 insights as, as to how the the msp is working and how we are going to move on from here so um nancy uh you have around uh 10 minutes so that we can be able to to finish on, in good time and and so that we're not locked out of the platform so um nancy you're welcome okay thank you thank you very much uh catherine and uh allow me to first thank the presenters of today uh, who have put together all these and made sure we have a successful day. And again, to the steering committee that has gone around ensuring that we get the panelists and we get the day moving. Uh, but most, uh, I, I am part of the st uh, steering committee, but also the thematic group on investments and partnerships. And we decided to put this day together for private finance or blended finance. Uh, one of the things that triggered me is because one day I sent to an entrepreneur two, two calls. One was a grant and another one was actually uh, the Plus Plus platform. And he actually told me, uh, I am an entrepreneur and I believe in private finance. I believe I can service the loan. It's more long term and it's more stressful. I, I was actually taken back. But I think that's the motivation I had to ensure that those coming on this platform are talking on how to support SMEs with either blended or private finance that, make, that are long-term and can really make them grow better rather than the one-year grants that always take them back. Um, talking about that, I want to, con to inform the participants that we will continue as a thematic group on investment, finance, and partnerships to, to bring more investors on board to look at what public finance or donor-led finance that is there and bring the presenters to the multi-stakeholder platform so that they connect with, with you and be able to give you information on which type of finance is out there to support climate smart agriculture. Uh, I would like to say that as a way forward, uh, I would like to say that we've been doing profiling work and we have profiled 35 organization, organizations work. And to say that the fact sheets are ready, we shall be sending them back to the members to confirm that that's the type of information they want to be published out there. In case you feel to be like being part of the MSP or you feel your organization is yet to be profiled, uh, we have sent Veronica's email in the chat box uh, please conduct her anytime and she will get you into the MSP and will get you profiled. Uh, I would also like to say that Laura has presented about our policy work. Our policy group is working hard to put a lot of evidence together, but also the Climate Change Unit is working with a number of uh, organizations to, to facilitate evidence gathering to support policy work, both nationally and globally. 
And we have requested the steering committee that the next multi-stakeholder platform meeting brings all this evidence together to be validated by the MSP before being presented to the national or the global policy makers. So uh, the next multi-stakeholder platform, probably that is coming very soon, will be on policy and evidence. Uh, towards the end, we also have our M&E group that is working on the indicators. We are already uh, at the process at an advanced stage of reviewing the CSA indicators that have been developed. And probably in one of the coming MSPs, we shall be validating the M&E framework and seeing how the different organizations will use it. So as a way forward, first of all, just like the church, because I go to church, we do an altar call. Uh, we are calling on more participants into the MSP. And as I've said, please conduct Veronica conduct any of us who, are, who has even been on the panel because they can easily connect with us, connect with anyone who gave you the link, uh, connect with Veronica, and we also have a Google group that you can also register in, and we are ready to share that with any of you who approaches us. Uh, we're also calling on partners who, who would be willing to first support this initiative. Uh, CCAPS and Biovision have supported this initiative for the last two years. But going into 2021, 2022, we, we are seeking for more support, but we are also seeking for support for those ones who can take the MSP down to the counties. So thank you very much if Sebastian is still around because he showed a lot of willingness and we are willing to have as many organizations as possible to help us to land into the 47 counties. Uh, uh, to, to just finish up, uh, once again, Allow me to thank the panelists again for creating time for this. The participants, we, we've had 70 participants who dropped slightly to 64. That mean, means we've managed to hold your, your concentration. And uh, the steering committee that has worked around this and ensuring that the day is successful. Thank you very much and to CCAPS for hosting this great day. And most important, Catherine, for allowing for having the good moderation done today. Thank you very much. And please keep COVID safe. And that's the end of my talk today. Thank you. I was informed by Catherine that the moment I finish my speech, that is when we shall close off. So I have officially closed the meeting. And please go well and keep safe. Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye, Nancy.